Every day when the sun rises, I feel love beating down my door. Every night when the moon is shining, I pray you'll be coming back for Just a whisper through the groves You find your comes Voice me Good morning and welcome back everyone to the people in the room and people online. We're going to go straight into our next speaker which is Dr. Laszlo Galus. Um, Laszlo is, the principal lecture, is a principal lecturer at Newbold College and head of the Centre for Ministry and Mission. He has a focus on New Testament studies, Johannine literature and New Testament eschatology in particular. Laszlo has authored a number of scholarly articles and five books, the most notable of which is his PhD dissertation that was published for a prestigious series by T. and T. Clark. Laszlo is an active member of the Church's Biblical Research Institute Committee and also the Biblical Research Committee of the Trans-European Division. He is involved in a number of projects, one of which involves acting as, as an associate director of the SDA Biblical Theological Dictionary. I am led to understand that Laszlo has other specialities, which are fruit-filled phyllo pastry desserts and tiramisu. However, rumors that he will appear on the Great British Bake Off are probably exaggerated. The title of Laszlo's presentation is Here Comes the Bully, the problem of violence in Revelation. Good morning. Thank you, Adrian, for your kind words of introduction. We live in a world which is pervaded by conflict and violence. In our age, massive harm is done to many people. And as you know, violence involves not only physical harm, violence can and may be psychological, it may be spiritual or economic as well. But the essence is the same. The target person is denied its right to freedom and it is caused a damage. So it is taken from him or her what he or she values. The intense political and military conflicts in last several decades and the threat of nuclear annihilation brought the matter of violence in the forefront of scholarly investigation. At some British universities, for instance, research centers have been opened and the postgraduate programs are offered which address the matter of conflict and peacemaking, 
violence and living in harmony. Also, we all know that the problem of right-wing radical extremism has recently become an increasing challenge for many societies, including uh, those on the European continent. In such a complex social-political context, it is not surprising that the how does the Bible, particularly the New Testament, relate to the issue of violence? Some of the stories and teachings of the Bible have been dismissed by critics precisely because they have been seen as violent. violent. And the book of Revelation is the key document in the discussion. Let me quote here only two authors. The first is Will Self, who is a British. Revelation is a sick text. Perhaps it's the occlusion of judgmental types and the congruent occlusion of psyches. But there is something not quite right about Revelation. The right of violent, majestic occurrence, it is a... The right of violent, majestic occurrence, it is a potentious horror film. Quite a strong uh, opinion. Or the other is a scholar. John Dominic Crossan, an American scholar, he says that Revelation is the most consistently and relentlessly violent text in all the canonical literature of all the world's greatest religions. So these are strong words. These are actually very, very strong charges. Revelation is attacked for its violent rhetoric from departing from Jesus' teaching on love for enemies. Moreover, it has been argued that God appears in the book of Revelation as a harsh despot, a bully who relates sickly to people living on the earth. And uh, as you can see, the question of violence is very closely linked to the topic of our con uh, conference, the character of God. The question is a methodological one here. How shall we approach this problem? First of all, we cannot simply deny or dismiss these charges as coming from people who do not have a high view of scripture as we, we have. That's not a good approach. We cannot simply simplistically say, read the gospels, uh, read the epistles of John, God is love, it's clear, that's it. That's not a good approach. No question, these and other documents have some important claims, but the question of violence should be answered in a more nuanced, in a more responsible way, primarily with arguments which come from revelation itself, and only then from its wider biblical theological context. Let I tell you immediately that the problem of violence in revelation is an extremely difficult and extremely complex scholarly question, and we do not have an easy answer to it. The fact is that we cannot deny violence in Revelation. There are a number of violent images in, in the book. For example, war is one of the principal metaphors in Revelation, or the seven seals, the trumpets, the seven balls of wrath are all they all picture escalating violence and warfare in a serial form. Or at the end of this series, in chapter 19, Jesus is pictured as a fearsome warrior who is riding on a white horse at the head of his army, and his robe is dipped in blood, and also a sharp sword is mentioned with which he strikes down the nations. In chapter 6, at the second coming of Christ, all the humanity, including its powerful rulers, desperately seek protection from the wrath of the Lamb. So clearly, there is no democracy in the book of Revelation. At the end, millions are going to die. Well, we cannot deny, and we do not want to deny these facts and these images. They are in the text of the book of Revelation. But we must say that this is not the whole story. This is only one side 
of the story, and selective reading of Revelation can lead to disastrous results. There are a number of questions which need to be answered before any interpretation of these images can take place. For example, who is behind the violence in the world? What is the nature of evil? And what is God doing about it? Is there an unseen cosmic dimension to the things happening in our world? Please note that the root of the problem of violence is the concept of evil. And the two go together. Violence and evil go together. Therefore, for any interpretation of violent imagery and revelation, it is absolutely necessary to clarify what evil in revelation is and how does it function in our world. First of all, let's explore the terminology of evil. Revelation employs directly the terminology of evil very rarely. And I mean here the two Greek adjectives, kakos and poneros, which can be translated as bad or evil. They occur only in two texts. In Ephesians, in message to the church in Ephesus, so in Revelation 2.2, we read, I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. Who are these evildoers? These are actually some church members who were confusing the community with false teaching. And the second reference is found in chapter 16, verse 2, in the first ball plague. And we read that an evil and painful saw came on those who had the mark of the beast. So only two direct references. However, much more important are the images of evil in Revelation. And these are images which have a very, very strong rhetorical charge. Let I give you several, just. The seven-headed red dragon, who is a rebellious figure who fights against Michael in heaven. Or we read about two blasphemous beasts. We read also about a great prostitute, who is the mother of abomination. We read about the throne of Satan. We read about synagogue of Satan and some other, uh, some other strong images. So all these images suggest that evil is an important concept. The fact that so strong images are used indicate the forceful influence of evil in the world. So let's turn to the reality and definition of, uh, of evil. If we can step back uh, one slide to B, please. In today's Western culture, there is a tendency to downplay, to, to downplay and even deny evil. Uh, many consider that the concept of evil belongs to the realm of superstition, mythology. But revelation is more than clear. Evil exists, evil is real, evil is personal. It is not abstract, it is not philosophical. Real demonic forces are behind human suffering and evil things. And these are forces which ruin God's good creation. So theologically, evil is the violation of good, which has its origin in God. And you see in this definition how evil and violence are closely connected. You see, evil is the violation. Evil is the violation of good. So the essence of evil is that it stands in opposition to good, in opposition to God's rule, in opposition to his kingdom. And for this reason, one's choice one's individual allegiance in life is of critical importance. Which kingdom am I aligning myself with? Let's discuss briefly the character of evil. One of the most important characteristics of evil is its deceptive nature. 
Evil does not work openly, but in a very cunning way. Satan is that ancient serpent who deceives the whole world, who blinds people to believe lies and to base their life on lies. The motive of deception is directly mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. The Greek word planao is the, the key term in this respect. According to Revelation, deception is taking place in the world around us, but surprisingly also in the church, according to Revelation. Revelation's basic rhetorical strategy is to demask the evil and reveal the truth. Even the name of the book is telling, Revelation suggests that something is revealed, something what is hidden is now seen. Actually, two things are revealed. First of all, God. His works, His purposes, His character is revealed. As um, Barbara Rossing, a famous uh, American scholar, would say that Revelation shows us a, a way into the heart of God. So God is revealed. But on the other hand, also the true face of evil is revealed. Revelation demasks the powers through which evil forces work. The readers of Revelation are shown clearly what the result of evil is. They are shown how evil ruins everything. Evil ruins created order, ruins the society, ruins the earth itself, ruins the human beings. And human beings are tricked to choose evil and tricked to destroy themselves. On the other hand, those who are opposed to the kingdom of God are often bullied. God's people are persecuted. They are even killed. Even God's principal agent of salvation, the Lamb, is killed. So in reality, who commits violence? And who suffers violence in the book of Revelation? Who is the bully in our world? Conclude for yourself. Of course, God is not indifferent towards what is taking place on the earth. He's opposed to evil. He's engaged in war against it because he does not give up on his created world. He does not give up on his beings created, on his image, by his own hands. But his ways are different from the ways of evil forces because God's ways are based on his character. For interpreting Revelation's imagery of violence responsibly, we need to understand how the book's symbolism functions. The basic statement in this regard is found in the opening statement of the, of the book. So first chapter, first verse, which says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So please pay attention to the words which are seen in red color on the slide. The phrase, he made it known. The Greek word which is behind this phrase is semaino. And semaino can be translated as signify or communicate by symbols. So Revelation communicates its message by using symbolic language. Everything is symbolic in this book, except when the context clearly indicates that it is not. And many misinterpretations of Revelation happen exactly because this basic hermeneutical principle is ignored. When we charge Revelation God and its, its main character with violence, we simply misunderstand how apocalyptic language works. We make a basic foundational hermeneutical mistake. We forget that symbolism is the blood of apocalyptic literature. When we bring our enlightenment perspective to the text, rather than reading the text on its own terms, we draw simply wrong conclusions. So the bottom line 
is the following. It is not enough to read the text of Revelation. It must be interpreted in line with its character, in light with its genre. The violent images of Revelation must be interpreted. The strong language is used for the purpose to, of, of stressing the seriousness of the consequence when people align themselves with evil. I will give you two examples from the, from the book itself. Uh, the first will come from Revelation 19, and in, in this chapter, Jesus is pictured as coming like a warrior on a white horse. And we read, And the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse, the sword that came from his mouth. So the text clearly states that the enemies of God are conquered. But please, note in the text, how are they conquered? The text says, through a word, through a sword, coming from the mouth of Christ. So this imagery points to the triumph, how? The triumph of God's word, rather than the literal slaughter of God's enemies. And let I stress here a very, very important point. God and Christ are pictured occasionally as warriors in the book of Revelation. We do not contest that, but they are never pictured in Revelation as engaging in a direct flight or combat with anyone. Okay? The Lamb is winning his victory over evil, but how? Not through aggression, not through manipulation, not through demonstrating force like the evil powers but through his own death. So please note that God never fights against people. God fights for people. He seeks their repentance. He seeks their salvation. He seeks their welfare. But at the same time, he fights against evil. And God is committed to er er eradicate evil from the universe because he will not tolerate Forces in the universe which ruin what is good. So God protects good as a value. Therefore, judgment over evil is for the sake of protecting good. So Revelation proclaims both hope and judgment in a world of violence, injustice and arrogance. The second example is related to the people of God. They are also pictured in militaristic terms. They are pictured as Conquerors, those who are victorious. And clearly you have here a military image in the, in the background. Conflict and conquering happen where? Normally in a war setting, isn't it? But please note that God's people conquer not through might and aggression, but through faithful witness and patient endurance. And that makes a difference. The key text in this regard is found in chapter 12, verse 11. And I will read the text. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. So we have here a metaphorical language in use. Conquering is not happening uh, by using weapons, but through means which are in harmony with God's character. In conclusion to this section, let I quote here uh, Richard Hayes. He's a very eminent, very well-known scholar uh, in our generation who says that uh, the symbolic logic of the work as a whole dismantles the symbolism of violence. It dismantles the symbolism of violence. This is a critically important point. Revelation should be read on its own terms. And its symbolic language is not an end in itself. It serves a certain rhetorical purpose. So let's move to our next section, uh, which will be on the lamp. So please, one slide back, uh, fifth section. Please note that the key image of God's response to evil is not an army, okay? It's, it's uh, the lamp. The lamp, or arnion in Greek, is the most important character in the book of Revelation. It appears altogether 28 times 
Actually, 28 times is applied to Jesus. There's a 29th reference, beast, which was like the lamb. So 28 times it's applied to Jesus, whose basic characterization is found in chapter 5. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, a lamb, standing as if it has been sla slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So please know that this text is the centerpiece of the chapter. The whole chapter is rhetorically built in a way to highlight this statement. And at least two points are important here for our purpose. Number one, Lamb is the one who conquered. So we have here conflict imagery. We have here combat. But how? How did he conquer? We read in the text, as if it had been slaughtered. So his slaughtering is the means of victory. It's very, we have a very interesting Greek word here. So sphazo, which is used here in perfect passive tense, uh, means literally to be brutally killed, to be, to be butchered, you see. In the Old Testament, this term was used for, for, for the sacrifices in the temple, which were, which were slain. The imagery of the slaughtered lamb is the key for Revelation's Christology. All passages about Jesus should be interpreted through the lens of this basic foundational characterization. And let I quote here David Barr, a very well-known scholar, who says that it is absolutely fundamental to the apocalypse that the violence through which Jesus is said to conquer evil is the violence done to him. Okay, the character of Jesus, his ethos is the lamb slain. So Jesus conquers not by inflicting violence, but by accepting the violence inflicted upon him in crucifixion. He conquers evil through his act of self-giving love. Therefore, his victory is a victory of not might and power, but it's a victory of values. He is a victim rather than aggressor in the book of Revelation. Uh, so let's summarize. What is God's response to evil? Number one, God is not indifferent to the evil. Evil is an irrational phenomenon which ruins good. Therefore, it shall not have a place in the universe. The strong metaphorical imagery involving the language of violence serves the purpose of demonstrating in an apocalyptic style God's intolerance in relation to evil. In other words, God is not a harsh ruler, but he's decisive in unveiling the true face of evil, and he's committing to eradicating evil from the universe. His inter in intervention reflects justice and not vengeance, and the two should not be confused. Number two, God's principal response to evil is the slaughtered lamb. He himself comes and bears the cross to redeem humanity. His way is a nonviolent way. His victory is a victory of values and, and love. Number three, God encourages his people to be patient with the realization of his plan. One of the most important terms in the book of Revelation is hypomone in Greek which can be translated as patient endurance. The Lord reveals in Revelation the unseen reality and the major contours of future to show his people that it is worth pursuing on the path of Christian discipleship. At the moment, there is no justice in this world. We all know that very well. But we are assured that it will be. It will be. God's ways are often mysterious. We will not understand a lot of things, but we are assured that God knows very well what he is doing. So he encourages us to demonstrate patience with his plan 
patient endurance. And at the end, we are sure that God will break decisively the chain of evil when the time comes. But he is committed to not taking shortcuts which do not work on long run. You know, the chain of evil at the end of history will not be broken by compassion and love. The spirit will be broken when the Lord intervenes mightily at the end of time. He works patiently and consistently in human history, but when the time comes, he will act mightily to protect good as a value which defines the basic structure of the universe, which is based on his character. So let's conclude at the very end. We live in a world in which we witness hatred every day. Living in this world, let's not forget that Revelation critiques the misuse of power and violence. It turns our attention to the slaughtered lamb as a role model for us, but also to the day when the spiral of violence will be broken and the peaceful kingdom of God be established. God will not triumph at the end only because he has more power than evil. No, he will triumph because goodness, love, and truth are greater forces in the universe as the opposite. And all this has a very strong ethical implication for us. The followers of the Lamb are called to be shaped and guided by these values. Amen. Our final speaker for today is, uh, for this morning's session, is Dr. Ike Muller. Ike is an ordained pastor and senior lecturer in New Testament studies at Newbold College. He has much traveled, having worked in various institutions and churches in Europe and the US, where he was an adjunct professor at Andrews University. Immediately before coming to Newbold, as well as a lecturer, he served as Assistant Seminary Dean at the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies in the Philippines. He is President-elect of the Adventist Theological Society, and his research interests include Gospel Studies, Narrative Analysis, and Intertextual Studies. You may not be aware, but Ica is the owner of a Ferrari, and I did say Ferrari, however it is still in its box, um, it will be approximately 59 centimeters long when he gets around to building it, and it's made of the sort of Lego I could only have dreamed about when I was but a lad. The title of Ica's presentation is God in Action, God's Character Revisited. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's good to be with you and it's good to be at this conference. I want to do something quite ambitious with you, and that is read a paper and invite you to do two things. Usually when we read a paper, we do either a new method or a new uh, passage. Uh, this case, I want to do both a new method and a new approach uh, and, and a new passage at, at the same time. So that's gonna be quite ambitious. When we look at character of God, the pursuit of understanding who God is, is common to all Christian denominations and regularly formulated in creedal statements, catechisms, or fundamental beliefs, however you want to call them. Even if you look at people that are former Christians or non-Christians altogether, they explore uh, religion or who God is through the presence or absence of declarative statements such as God is love or Jesus is the Son of God. Contrary to the abundance of declarative statements such as these, in literature or belief statements these phrases are sometimes less helpful than it at first appears and so that's what I want to explore with you today. And then at the end, I want to explore a new reading of the actions of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts and see how we could apply this new uh, approach to a reading of the character of God. The traditional approach 
whether uh, ancient documents in church history, philosophical discussions, or the popular talk in a church pew, the character of God is typically discussed in determinative statements. These statements might be dogmatic. God is triune. Uh, they might be technical. God is immutable. They might be used in an apologetic sense. God is just. Or they might be used in comforting purposes. God is there for you. But all of these are declarative statements. God is. God is something. And I have defined what he is. There are several good reasons for this traditional approach of looking at it in terms of declarative statements. Uh, and that has to do, uh, when we talk about it, uh, that actually in Scripture, we have in the opening books of, to the end of Scripture, God's character is described quite often in these declarative statements. And I've put together uh, a couple of these here. God is merciful. God is a merciful God. God is with you wherever you go. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and so on and so on. You'll be able to read that while I continue. These are declarative statements. They make a simple statement about who God is. So first of all, the Bible actually uses these. So that's a good reason why we use them as well. Secondly, it is often taken for granted that the meaning of declarative statements is clear to understand and to follow. They seem on the surface to be very clear. There is no guesswork or hermeneutical backflips that are necessarily associated with passages under consideration. Uh, contrary to the text says, here we have something. Thirdly, the statements are short and to the point, and therefore, one could argue, easily remembered. But there are a couple of reasons. Um, here we go. They are declarative statements. They're clear. They're brief. And they're easy to remember. These are all good reasons why we use declarative statements. But there's also some challenges. Despite these advantages and even scriptural support, there are several reasons why the declarative statements on the character of God are less helpful than we think they are. First, despite our initial impulse, declarative statements are far less clear than it at first appears. This can be for several reasons. The terms used in scripture can be outdated or face language barriers. For example, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 18, God is described literally as long-nosed. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the Hebrew concept of having a long nose signifies patience, or the King James translation translates it as long-suffering. Others translate it as long-tempered, which differs dramatically how we understand a Pinocchio or long nose today. So sometimes the language just changes. Translations of scripture therefore avoid a literal translation here of the Hebrew in Numbers to avoid confusion. Otherwise, we would have a very different picture of who God is. So their first reason is uh, declarative statements are not always clear from one language to the next. There's other reasons. Other misunderstandings can occur because of complicated words that are very uh, technical. For example, God is immutable. That is a wonderful phrase that systematic theologians like to use. Um, but for the common person, it's hard to really, we don't use that in our vocabulary. Sometimes it's because words are too vague. God is eternal. Well, what does that mean? Does eternal here refer to a temporal statement that has neither beginning or end, or just, or just one but not the other? We would like to make that distinction in some of our studies. So which one is it then? Even the seemingly obvious statement, God is love, is by no means a clear statement. For as soon as this is said, the question of what is love follows. Love today and in the ancient world had many different meanings, and not only language and semantic range of different terms must be accounted for, but also who spoke and into what context. So even the Bible writers will define love differently from one book to the next and use the terms differently. Secondly, declarative statements are not available for all of the characteristics of God. Christian tradition has wrestled with many aspects of the character of God, such as the divinity of Jesus, or the divinity of the Holy Spirit, or even the Trinity. But these, among other characteristics, are not clearly identified by declarative statements. 
among lay members and scholars, as will be noted below. This has caused, the di caused diverse and conflicting positions. Third reason why they're not as helpful uh, or, or not as clear, it's easy to ignore the context of the passages in which declarative statements are found. If we go back to one of the earlier passages that I had here, we have a passage from Job, Job chapter 36, verse 5. God is mighty. But this uh, is a passage from Job 36 that Elihu speaks. This is not Job speaking. It's not God speaking. It's Elihu's perspective. And, and here he defines God as being mighty because he binds those in chains. He declares to them their transgressions, those that consider themselves righteous, and then he humbles those that think themselves are, are righteous. In this in, in instance, Elihu admonishes Job to repent for his transgressions. Otherwise, he might perish by the sword and die without knowledge, just a few verses down. The perspective of Elihu and the statement that God is mighty do not represent an accurate view of God in the specific instance of Job's suffering or of, Job in, of God in general. Similar caution must be applied to other declarative statements as well. It's easy to extract a declarative statement and ignore all of its context. Fourth reason why declarative statements are not as clear as we often think them. Very often, modern conceptions of terms are read back into declarative statements. For example, the phrase, the Lord, the righteous judge, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, often evokes an image of a modern courtroom consisting of, of a role distribution founded on Western legal theories and filled with judges, defendants, plaintiffs, prosecutors, lawyers, and juries. But here Paul actually elicits the imagery of Jesus as a judge in a sporting event. Paul has completed his race faithfully in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. So in the next verse, he's awaiting his laurel wreath or the victory crown, the Stephanos, as a reward. Without doubt, Paul transitions from his current life to an eschatological dimension of a reward ceremony that includes recognition of what Jesus has done for the believer, deliverance from sin, but also the faithful participation of the follower in the proclamation of the kingdom of God. But here it's not a legal setting. It's a setting of a, of a race, of an Olympic event. Finally, most of scripture is actually a narrative or a story, storytelling, rather than philosophical or theological discourses concerning the nature of God or any other topic. Instead, the genre of narratives make up the majority of the Old and the New Testament writings. The faith journey in the Old Testament is narrated in the stories of the patriarchs, the Exodus and the desert wandering, the land settlement, and through the historical writers to the kings and the prophets. In the New Testament, the journey continues with the Gospels, Acts, and a number of sections within the epistles that tell stories. While declarative st statements do also exist in narratives from time to time, nonetheless, other storytelling devices rule stronger, and I want to explore that with you in just a moment. In summary, contrary to popular and academic opinion and usage, declarative statements are less helpful than we are usually aware. So let's take a look at how we could do a different, uh, take an, an additional look by using narrative statements. Considering the limitations outlined above, we can now turn to new perspectives of reflecting of the character of God in scripture. As noted, the narrative genre makes up a large and the largest part of scripture in biblical literature. And stories have their own way of transmitting information to reader to the reader about the characters in each story. These include round versus flat characters, dynamic versus static, and for our purposes most important, showing versus telling. In telling, a storyteller comments directly on a character, singling out a trait for us to notice or make an evaluation of a character. This is much like what we've been talking about in terms of declarative statements. A narrator might say, John is a good boy. That would be telling. But storytellers have a more influential way to share characteristics of a person, and that is by showing. 
in showing, which is also called the dramatic method or indirect presentation, the author simply presents the characters talking and acting and leaves the reader to infer the motives and dispositions that lie behind what they say and do. A narrator describes uh, John using a very simple showing sentence. And, and that would sound something like this. Uh, so as telling, we said, John is a good boy. If I did showing, I would say, John helps an elderly lady or an elderly neighbor by carrying a heavy bag of groceries. In this case, the audience infers that John has the trait of being a good boy, in the second case, but we can now see, hear, and feel the situation that actually demonstrates that. The good now has a visual representation. Despite losing maybe some clarity, showing conveys much more information to the audience. The reader can feel as, he, as if he or she is part of the story and is invited into this participatory event of reading and evaluating. At the same time, the story has become more expressive, descriptive, emotive, and actually even memorable. But this raises an important question. If, so, if showing is so evocative and even popularly used, how, can, how come we don't hear about it more in the discussions of the character of God? The challenge lies in the very definition of showing. The action of a character is portrayed, but the meaning must be inferred. For this, a very careful and wide-ranging exegesis must be established that often exceeds the limitations of time or space for a single article, and theologians turn rather to declarative statements themselves. So what I want to explore in the rest is how could we apply that, and there, for that, I first want to give an example. For years, critical scholars have promoted the view that since the Gospels do not record Jesus making a declarative statement to his divinity, that therefore Jesus is not divine and never viewed himself as anything other than a carpenter, a peasant, peasant would be John Dominic Cosson, who we just heard, or a teacher. It was only the later church that wished to redeem themselves socially for the failed expectations of another Messiah that had failed. In the aftermath of the disappointment, they fabricate the resurrection and rewrite the Jesus story. And so one of these most featured and prominent theologians that presents on this uh, quite regularly is Bart Ehrman. Uh, he makes some of these statements in his books called Misquoting Jesus or Forged Writing in the Name of God. Jesus didn't say anything about himself, no declarative statement, therefore he didn't actually believe himself to be that a divine person. Or, and there's two fallacies right there in this argument. It's an argument from silence, meaning uh, there is no statement, so therefore it excludes that it even is possible. And also, it doesn't actually consider what we just talked about, namely showing. It's only looking at the telling part. N.T. Wright, uh, a very famous theologian, has countered this claim with temple theology. And he summarizes his argument this way. The return of Yahweh to Zion and the temple theology what it brings into focus are the deepest keys and clues to gospel Christology. Forget the titles of Jesus, at least for a moment. Focus instead on a young Jewish prophet telling a story about Yahweh returning to Zion as a judge and redeemer and then embodying it by riding into the city in tears, symbolizing the temple's destruction. Last line, he would embody himself in returning and redeeming action of the covenant God. What he actually then does is go through the Gospels and N.T. Wright explores how Jesus in all instances demonstrated that he is the greater temple. He can forgive sins because he's greater than the temple. He can cleanse the temple because it's his temple and so on and so on. And he goes passage by passage demonstrating at the end that Jesus acted even though we might not have a direct statement, a declarative statement, Jesus acted as if he was the Messiah, the Son of God, who owned and operated the temple. That brings us to an exploration of if we can apply the same principle into, the, uh, into Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we've, so we've established a, a new outlook, and we've looked at one example, the temple theology of N.T. Wright, and now that allows us to take this 
short excursus into the opening chapters only of the of Acts and explore if there is more to understand about the character of God if we look at the showing, not just the telling. Much like questions about Christology, many questions have been raised about the actions and place of the Holy Spirit. Again, much effort has been poured searching for declarative statements or defending, at times in obscure ways, difficult passages. But in Luke's second volume, the book we now know is Acts of the Apostles, Luke applies a very similar approach about the Holy Spirit as N.T. Wright has already demonstrated for Jesus in the first volume. Exploring the actions of the Holy Spirit in Acts will give us, uh, will present a new exodus motif for the Holy Spirit. Listening carefully to this showing demonstration will actually demonstrate much about the character of the Holy Spirit. In the first chapter of Acts, Luke anticipates the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I've put the key passages here in chapter 1. Uh, the Holy Spirit launches the com community into the public realm. Three iterations of the promise of the Holy Spirit are shared, each connected with different imagery. In Acts chapter 1, verse 2, it opens with Jesus ascending and his command to the, the disciples to await the Holy Spirit. That Jesus commands is not new information by itself, but Luke does something very peculiar by using the word entelo in a very unique use because it's always used in the, in the realm of covenant language. Moses had commanded, and that's a reference to the Sinaitic law. God had commanded in John chapter 15 and four, uh, verse 14. Jesus had commanded in, at the end of, uh, of Matthew in chapter 28. But significantly, the subject always revol revolves around covenants. The Mosaic laws of the Sinaitic covenant are referred to in the Gospels. Hebrews 9 verse 20 uses the same term, entelo, but explicitly references the blood of the covenant from Exodus 24, verse 8. Uh, implicitly, uh, we have references to the covenant formula in Acts 13, 47 that cites Isaiah 49. Surprisingly, then, Acts 1, 2 is the only reference that makes the Holy Spirit the agent through whom Jesus makes these commands. Je the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, uh, the command is issued to the disciples. In the subsequent verses, Luke will point out that the command of Jesus consists of waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in verses 5 and 8. The Holy Spirit thus becomes the agent through whom the command is issued, but also the command itself. Later in Acts, Paul and Barnabas claim, this is in 1347, that the Lord commanded entelo them. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Though Paul was not present at the ascension, he mirrors the language that we find here in the opening verses of Acts chapter 1. He claims the same idea found in Acts 1.8 to bring salvation to the whole world as a mandate for Gentile mission. Interestingly, Paul uses the wording of Isaiah 49 to establish this, and that itself is already hearkening back to the Exodus event. So in a roundabout way, we've come back to the Exodus event as where all of this begins and from where Luke and Paul draw their background. Uh, Blenkinsop has wrote on this, a major commentary on Isaiah. He's, he notes the structural markers, the repetition of the Exodus theme and he adds the possibility of imagery of a new Moses who will lead the exodus from the diaspora as the old Moses did from Egypt. Though supported by an Isaiah passage, Paul nonetheless connects his experience with the risen Lord to the same covenant contract that the Israelites experienced. As the Israelites were led out of Egypt by God, so the Holy Spirit will lead the apostles into a new era of salvation to the ends of the earth. At the end of chapter 1, we get into one of the most interesting passages, namely the critical shift of theological thinking, how they understand themselves in Acts 1, verse 12 to 23. This is where, the, uh, where Matthias is voted as the 12th member. This is right before the Pentecost event, and something has shifted. They now understand themselves as a community of 12 and that the number 12 must be important. The Holy Spirit now becomes the agent through to, uh, uh, that communicates through David prophetic insight that applied to the early church. They are to be the new Israel. 
here a quotation, the total of 12 was significant. It corresponded to the number of the tribes of Israel, and they may have marked the apostles out as leaders of the new Israel. So again, we have uh, new Israel and, uh, and Exodus imagery here. Implied in Peter's testimony before the assembly is also that the Holy Spirit has been working on his own understanding that he's applying these passages from the Psalms and from David to uh, himself and to the community. So the Holy Spirit features prominently in chapter 1, opening pages of, in the opening pages. Uh, he is both the promise but also an agent, not just to David long ago on the one hand and to the apostles at this point, but also in covenant formulas and new Exodus imagery. This then lets us go back to Acts 1 verse 5 where we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and this unique phrase, baptism of the Holy Spirit, because actually there is no dipping of water in this Holy Spirit event that we will see in Acts chapter 2. And the question is, what does this baptism mean and why does it talk about the immersion in water if there is no more Jordan River experience for these, for these disciples uh, that turn into apostles? Uh, the answer might be very well, again, uh, imagery like the Red Sea, which is a theological theme that we can find in many other places in the New Testament. Imagery that the people would have been quite familiar with. The parting of the sea in Exodus story is then portrayed again as the entrance into a new era. As God did for the literal Israelites, so the Holy Spirit leads the community through this watershed movement towards the Mount Sinai and the Promised Land. Acts chapter 2, and we will conclude with uh, Acts chapter 2, but there's a couple things to point out here. The Pentecost event overlays multiple trajectories. There's prophetic views, there's eschatological, there's missional perspectives, and there's a lot going on. More interesting for our study this morning is the exploration of the illusions uh, of, that connect the Holy Spirit to the Exodus event. The opening lines of Acts chapter 2 identify the Pest Pentecostal festival as drawing large cards together. It is well attested that Pentecost is a harvest festival, but less so that Pentecost also functions as a remembrance to the giving of the law of Sinai. But multiple allusions in, Pentecost, in the Pentecost event actually allude to the Exodus event. First is the timing of the event. It's 50 days after the Passover, and that's both close enough to be connected to the Exodus event, but also long enough for the Israelites to make the journey to Mount Sinai. So when you get to the Sinai event, Jews celebrated, particularly in the second half of the first century, this as a covenant renewal and pilgrim pilgrimage, according to John Walton. The combined effect of covenantal language in chapter 1 and covenant imagery in the festival, and now in the Sinai covenant, renewal signify a new beginning for this community. Second, the imagery of wind and fire. In his discussions on the various physical emanations, Craig Keener points out in his huge commentary on Acts, a variety of storm image theophanies in scripture that feature wind and fire. There is the Elijah story, there's visions in Ezekiel, as well as the inauguration of the temple, but none is as clear as the Sinai event. When we have the, the, the tongues of fire and the wind that comes, this is, a rem, uh, this is reminiscent of the, exod uh, the Sinai event and the Exodus event. The storm, he says, the stormy images of wind and fire recall various theophanies, including the pillar of cloud and fire. And scholars cite especially the following, he says, the Sinai event. Additionally, there is a sound that appears, and the, and Two different words are used here in Acts, two different words that are allusions to the Sinai event, because God speaks in this event. This is alluding to the voice of God speaking to Moses and the people in Exodus 19, verse 16 to verse 19. This is reinforced not just in imagery, but it is noteworthy, quotation, that outside of Luke's usage here, the New Testament uses this Greek word only once, in the description of the revelation of Sinai in Hebrews 12, verse 19. So only one other time do we have this, uh, this imagery. 
of the noise, the noise as a connection point, the sound, God speaking. But in this passage now, it's not God speaking, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. And so there's a parallel there. Fourth and last point to connect these passages, the content of the Apostles' Glossolalia in verse 11 highlights the mighty deeds of God. Eckhart Schnabel in his Zondervan commentary has noted that this is a term that is singularly used for God's miraculous intervention in Israel's history, particularly the exodus and wilderness events. So again, another illusion. So we have now four layers of illusions to the Exodus event here. And the Holy Spirit is acting in and through each one of these. The Pentecost event obviously overlays multiple imageries, not just the Sinai event. Allusions to the eschaton and prophetic visions for the future are, are one forward-looking part of Acts chapter 2, and there's also community building and other things. But at the same time, the covenant renewal at Sinai is a very important and very overlooked, backwards-looking precedent to demonstrate the significance of the events around Pentecost. A new community is established, and the covenant is renewed. The experience of the early group of believers models closely the experience of the Israelites, from darkness to new beginnings, an exodus. Significantly for our reflection, in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is the agent in the New Testament that parallels what God did in the Old Testament. If we think that God is amazing in the Exodus event, in the New Testament, all those significant elements of the Exodus story are now presented by the Holy Spirit. When God spoke from the mountaintop, so now the Holy Spirit echoes on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That's chapter 2 to conclude all of our thoughts. In conclusion, we've proposed a new approach of looking at scripture, an additional approach, looking at the character of God by exploring not just the telling parts, which are in scripture, but also the value of the showing of who God is and how the stories present characters and demonstrate them. And that can be enriching to each of us in, in, the, in the church pew in our own reading of scripture. Uh, very often church members, but also astute theologians, as I pointed out, underestimate the significance of these stories and how much we can actually read uh, from these stories about who God really is and thereby better understand the God that we follow. Then in the second part, this paper explored a narrative reflection of the character of the Holy Spirit in the opening chapters of the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is set into a rich tapestry of the new exodus. In the parallel between the exodus for the Israelites and the new exodus for the apostles, the Holy Spirit functions in parallel to God that led the Israelites out of captivity. Just as God spoke through Moses, so the Holy Spirit speaks now through David and Peter. Just as the Israelites passed through the Red Sea, so the apostles are baptized by the Holy Spirit, just like God visibly and audibly passed before the Israelites to Zion, so the Holy Spirit appears in Acts chapter 2 in wind, flames, and noise. Further explorations could add many more parallels that occur later on in the book uh, that relate the Exodus event to the early church, the Ananias and Sapphira versus Achan the selection of the seven elder deacons in chapter 6, and Moses' selection of the 70 elders, both of them that are filled with the Spirit. Uh, Simon the Mag Magician versus Balaam and the issue of the Spirit and, and wrong perceptions of God. But for the purposes of exploration of the character of God, a narrative analysis can add important dimensions that substantiate our understanding of the Holy Spirit's place in the Trinity. For our personal experience, I hope we can see new dimensions and grow in our own reading of scripture as we explore new aspects of the character of God and new ways of reading scripture. Thank you very much, Aika. And we have now come to the end of this morning session. Um, there are now services uh, going to take place here and over at Salisbury Hall at 11.15. And then the uh, more academic presentations will commence again at 2.30 this afternoon. 
So we're just going to finish with a prayer. If I can invite Ica back up to pray for us, and then we'll conclude. I invite you to stand for a closing prayer to our morning session. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and how you've led the many people before us and how you've led us in our lives. Our lives are full of stories as well, stories of your leading, memories of how you've dealt with us in the past. As we explore scripture from new perspectives and listen to different voices, uh, we are made aware of how multifaceted you are and how limited our understanding at times is. Thank you for the glimpses that we already have. And as we explore a better understanding of you in scripture and in our lives, we ask that you continue to bless us. We ask this in your name.